G'day. I've been speaking to and working with people and organisations for years, helping them to become more innovative. And they all know that they should constantly be looking for better ways to do things. That's all innovation is, looking for better ways of doing things. But sometimes things get in the way. The organisation's culture might resist innovation. There might be people in key positions who aren't open to new ideas. People might have good intentions about being innovative, but there's always something more urgent, so they never quite get to it. And I help them unlock those barriers. Then in March, COVID came and very quickly, we all had to change the way we worked, the way we communicated, how we socialised, even what we did for leisure. You had to rethink everything about your business. If you work in the events industry, instead of getting bookings, you were getting cancellations or at best indefinite postponements. You had to work out how to stay afloat, what you needed to do differently, and in Australia, how to stop people stealing your toilet paper. It was tough, still is. But in that time, you were really innovative. You worked out what the challenges were, what you had to do differently, then you did it. You had what I call innovative urgency. You had to be innovative to survive. And what I want to encourage you to do today is as things gradually open up, as we emerge into the post-COVID world, is to not just automatically go back to normal. I want to encourage you to harness the innovative energy COVID forced you to generate and keep using it every day to keep looking for ways to improve your business. Because if you do that, your business will stay healthy and continue to evolve and if you don't, it runs the risk of stagnating. So to help you do that, I'm going to run through some of the barriers you'll face when you want to be innovative and explain how to overcome each one. And the first one is, I'm too busy. You want to work on making your business better, but you're too busy with all the other things you have to do. When COVID came, you found time because you had to. You identified problems, worked out what to do about them. As things open up, It'll be de tempting to deprioritize innovation. Don't do that. If you're spending 100% of your time dealing with today's challenges and 0% of it working on how to get your business ready for tomorrow, I would suggest you over prioritizing today at the expense of tomorrow. I'm not suggesting 50 50. What about 98 2? 2% of your time, 5 or 10 minutes a day thinking about how to do things better, making some innovation time. Do it every day for the next two weeks, then it'll become a habit and you'll do it every day. Really valuable time. The second big barrier to innovation is people labelling themselves as being not innovative. I'm not like Steve Jobs. You don't have to be. The vast majority of innovation isn't done by geniuses. It's done by people like you and me engaging with the challenges and opportunities we have and working out how to do things a little bit better. I've worked with over a thousand successful innovators, hardly any of them are geniuses. What will help is a process. And the first step is to identify opportunities for innovation, which means looking through your business for anything that isn't perfect. Anything that isn't perfect is an opportunity for innovation. So here's three places to look. At your processes and systems. Look at each one. Can you make one, uh, can you make some of them just a little bit more efficient? If you can, over a year, that results in big div dividends. And they're not hard to find. Let me give you an example. I went to, last time I went to the movies, I guess back in February, I bought my ticket online, had it on my phone. But then when I got to the theatre, I had to line up so a guy could look at my ticket on my phone, then print out and hand me a paper ticket. And I said, why do we do that? That's an inefficient process. Like I had a ticket, I showed you, you just gave me a different ticket. Why didn't we just not do that? And the 11 year old boy behind the counter went, Ugh! And But you can find processes that you can make more efficient. Look for your interaction, through your interactions with people for innovation, huh? Usually we don't think about the way we interact with people as being a fertile ground for innovation, but it is. Every time you have an interaction with someone that doesn't go perfectly, a client, uh, someone you report to, someone you manage, we usually blame them. But it's an opportunity for you to step back and think, what can I do differently next time that'll get me closer 
to the result I want. Analyze what you did, what you can do better. That's innovation. Let me give you a great example of innovation in interactions with people. A Dutch bicycle company uh, made most of their sales online and sent their bikes in flat packs all around the world to their customers. Problem they had is that a lot of the bikes were getting damaged in transit. How can we get people, baggage handlers and couriers, to treat them with more care, they asked. This is what they did. Picture of a flat screen TV on every package. Merely doing that changed the behaviour of everyone handling their parcels. So damage is reduced by what? 75%. What can you do to get your staff, your customers, to act in the way you want them to? You can tell them, but are there more powerful ways of nudging them in the direction that you want them to go? Third place to look for opportunities for innovation, whenever anyone gets frustrated. If you get frustrated, there's an opportunity for innovation there. Keep a list of when you get frustrated, when clients, when staff get frustrated. Each one of them is an opportunity to work on. I get frustrated when I'm waiting for a coffee. There's an opportunity for innovation there. I don't know what it is, but there definitely is one because lots of people spend a lot of time waiting for coffee. All problems are opportunities to be innovative. The third big barrier to innovation, habitual thinking. Habitual thinking happens when we get so used to doing things one way, we forget there might be another way. Why do you do it that way? We do it that way because that's the way we do it, circular logic. We need processes and systems, but we need to be able to break out of habitual thinking, see what we do with fresh eyes, to find better ways of doing things. Let me give you three strategies. First one, is to question everything you do. Here's an example. Science teacher in Pittsburgh to his class. Think of a way of saving the school money. 14-year-old boy, severe merchandani. Thinks about all the paper they use, handouts, etc. Thinks about all the ink on the paper. Goes home, types 300 words on a document on his computer, copies it to three other documents, changes the font on each one, prints them out and weighs them. Look at the bottom one, Garamond. Letters are a little bit thinner. He found that if his school changed their printing from the font they're using to Garamond, ink bills would reduce by 24%. The school district would save $21,000. If the US government did it, printed everything on Garamond, they'd save $370 million. What a great example of questioning everything. Fonts are literally right in front of our eyes all day, every day, we never think about them, we never question them. By the way, I just use the word literally correctly. You know, everyone misuses that word. They say, I literally exploded. When no, it was a metaphor. Question everything you do. Maybe you do 84 things in a normal week. Question each one and think, is it possible we might be able to do it a bit better? 82 times you might say no. I bet you find a couple of opportunities for innovation. Challenge your assumptions. We all make assumptions all the time. Times change so quickly, often assumptions that were valid become outdated. For example, big companies have assumed that their people have to travel into the city to work in tall buildings. COVID forced them to question that assumption. And many have found that working at home, people are really productive, they communicate well, and they save all that communi uh, commuting time. Lots of big companies, no way they're going back to that model. They'll have a smaller office space. They'll, have, uh, they, they'll save heaps of money. Why did it take a pandemic to force them to question their assumptions? What assumptions are you making that maybe you should question? Third and very powerful strategy, think like a customer. Put yourself in your customer's shoes. See your business and the way uh, they interact with your business from their point of view. Uh, I was speaking to the head of a large Australian supermarket company. He said he goes into customers' houses, looks for insights into how their shop looks in their cupboards, looks in their fridge. I'm assuming with their permission. I don't think he goes around breaking in. But be brave enough to ask your customers when you finish a job for them, look them in the eye and say, what can we do better next time? Don't send them a survey. People hate surveys. But they love being empowered by you humbly and honestly saying, what can we do better next time? And if you do that, 
you'll get some powerful insights that help you to improve your business. That's a great story. Don't have time to tell it to you today. I hope I will in a longer form discussion. The next big barrier to innovation is people thinking it's too hard. I uh, Look, I tried what you said and I identified some opportunities for innovation in my business and I just didn't have an idea really quickly. If you feel frustrated that sometimes it's hard, that you're not getting anywhere with innovation, that means you're doing it right. Everyone feels like that. A lot of people give up at that point and label themselves non-innovative. Don't. Keep going. And I promise you, you will have an idea. Might not be very good, but then you'll have another idea and eventually you will have a great idea that improves your business. Again, having a process will help. Think. Really engage with the challenge or opportunity. When you have an idea, value it. Treat it like it's important. And thirdly, use it. Do something with your idea. Take it out into the real world. See if it's going to fly or die. Which brings me to the next big barrier, fear of failure. If you want to go on the innovative adventure, the innovative journey, recalibrate your relationship with failure. It's not something you should use to label yourself non-innovative. Failure is a necessary journey on the path to innovation. It's part of it. It happens every time we try. Hardly anyone has a great idea with their first idea. It's the fifth or, uh, or sometimes the sixth. You know, WD-40, you know why it's called that? They had 40 goes, 39 failures. WD-24, pretty ordinary. WD-33, not much better. WD-40 made hundreds of millions of dollars. Push through failure, find the next idea. And the sixth and final barrier to innovation, I can't do it on my own. You know, I'm in a big organisation. Involve your team. Create an innovative culture. How do you do that? Look, I could talk, to, talk about that for 20 minutes, but I won't. I'll talk about it for a minute or two. But I want to give you two really powerful ways to start creating an innovative culture in your organisation. One, make it clear it's part of everyone's job. Everyone's job, from the receptionist to the CEO. Part of your job is doing your job. Another part of it is thinking about how we can do things better. People love being empowered like that, but make them accountable too. It's a KPI. We want you to give us one idea a month. It doesn't have to be a good idea. It doesn't have to be a big idea. But once a month, you've got to come up with a new idea to make things better. Very powerful way of helping to create an innovative culture. And then secondly, create a clear, credible and transparent system to harvest all those ideas and make sure they don't get lost. Lots of people are great at getting ideas out of people, then they're not sh quite sure what to do, do about them. Think about a sales pipeline. All the leads go in the bottom, series of steps, conversions come out the top. Similarly with an innovation system, all the ideas go in the bottom. What happens next? Who's responsible? Who picks which ideas go to the next level? What's the accountabilities? What's the timeline? Make sure that you get all those things nailed down and then you'll build an innovation pipeline with raw ideas coming out, uh, going in the bottom and the ones that are going to work, that are going to make a measurable improvement to your business coming out the top and being implemented into your business. They are six barriers to innovation, but I hope now you don't see them as barriers. You see them as obstacles that you'll be able to overcome. Try and harness that energy you generated when COVID came, when you had to look at everything with fresh eyes and work out to, uh, what to do. As things open up again, keep that innovative energy, create an innovation habit, keep looking at everything you do, working out how to do it better and you'll set your business up for success. Thank you.